Welcome everyone. This segment is on nominations and elections and how to correctly elect your leadership. My name is Larry Taylor. Uh, to uh, give you an overview of what we will be talking about today on the next slide, uh, we will be reviewing state statutes in Oregon uh, and spe specifically section 248. If you're in other states, uh, you should go out and check to see what, what sections of your uh, your your Oregon, Oregon or what sections of your law apply? Uh, then we will review bylaws, uh, and then we will re review standing rules, and then we will see what Robert's Rules of Order has to say about um, uh, elections and nominations. This is one of the areas of Robert's Rules where you really have to step back and see the bigger picture of things to do it correctly. Um, but uh, as in everything else with parliamentary procedure, anything that's not specified in your bylaws then defaults to Robert's Rules of Order. Uh, and so even though a lot of this material is Oregon specific, it, it, it's really just knowledge that you can take back to your own state and do your own research. Um, the, there's a lot of material today, uh, but the great thing about having this recorded is that you can always go back to the video and review anything that you missed. And we're also citing the sections of the bylaws and the state Oregon statutes so you can go out and verify everything yourself if you want to see the original text. So going to the next slide, uh, what we'll talk about is state statutes and how those apply to um, elections. Uh, most people would be surprised at how much is governed uh, of the the uh, in the political parties with uh, state law, and to find uh, political parties so cl clearly spelled out in in the state law. So it's not like the Constitution, which makes no reference to political parties. It's actually very explicit inside the um, the Oregon state laws and. Of course, they're divided into major party laws and then minor party laws. Uh, these that I'll be going over today are m applicable to major parties uh, and specifically to the Democratic Party. Uh, so uh, section 248 is the overall section. And then I'm going to go through each of the subsections because there's requirements that are built in there that are quite a ways in advance of whenever you have your uh, county election. And just so we get the language right, uh, in, when you have elections inside of political parties, the, the the word used to refer to these is reorganization, and that really refers to the election of officers. So these these are all about the, uh, the, re, the reorganization events that happen inside the parties, both at the county level and at the state. So section 248.05, each party, uh, political party by rule shall ensure the widest and fairest representation of party members in the party organization and activities. Rules shall be adopted by procedures that assure that the fair and open participation of all interested political parties, party members. Uh, so this, this refers to everyone who's registered as a Democrat within the Democratic Party. Um, and you'll see how that manifests itself in the next couple of sections. The next one uh, is section 248.12. The chairperson of a county central committee or state central committee shall notify by mail the entire membership of the committee no later than the sixth day before the date of an anticipated meeting, except for the notice of an organizational meeting of a county central committee uh, failure to give timely notice of the time, date, and place of a meeting shall invalidate the business of the meeting. So this is in general for any any meeting of a county or the state party that doesn't meet this notice requirement of all of its members, the the work done during that meeting is invalid. This applies to all the counties who have not notified their people by mail uh, and for whom they think that email is sufficient, but there's members that they don't have email addresses for. So if there are people out there who are have been elected to your county party uh, and they're not receiving notices of your, your meetings, the, your, they, you could be challenged and the work done in the meetings would be invalidated. Next slide, uh, section 248.23. <clears throat> no later than the 31st day after a primary election, the county clerk shall prepare, maintain, and furnish to the chairpersons of the respective retiring county central committees, committees within the county and the chairpersons of the state central committee 
a list of the party precinct committee persons elected and certified. At the same time, the county clerk shall declare the other offices of committee person vacant. So this is the requirement that, that says that all of the county elections offices must let the county parties know who their membership are. These are the people that you have to notify of your meetings in order for your meetings to be valid. The next one is 24824. Uh, when a precinct committee person ceases to be registered in the precinct in which the committee person was elected or a precinct adjoining that precinct within the same county changes in political party registration or dies, the county central committee shall notify the county clerk of that fact. So this is about making sure your membership roles are correct. If you have a, um, a precinct committee person that moves away, uh, you need to notify your county clerk that they have done so, so they can keep your uh, membership roles accurate. If you're ever questioned about who voted in one of these meetings, especially at the reorganization, it's the county uh, clerk that has the official role of who the members, who the voting members are. Hey, Larry. Yes. A question on that, because I am a precinct committee person, and I believe I am elected at this point. Um, why is it, is it just precinct committee people? Who does the voting? Is it just PCPs or? Just elected or appointed PCPs at the county level, yes. Oh, okay, okay, so that's important to know. So if you're a PCP out there, if you signed up to do this, then this applies to you and, that, and this is important. You're the ones making these votes for uh, the reorganization, right? Yes. Okay, good to know. I guess I'll have to be at the meeting. <laughs> it would be great. Um, uh, next slide, uh, section 248-2026. Um, a person selected to fill a vacancy in the office of precinct committee person may not vote on the election of a county central committee officer at the organizational meeting of the committee. Uh, the, there was a lot of, over the years, I've heard a lot of uh, stories about this and arguments, but it's really in state law. So, if you are not elected, which is what they mean when they say a person filled to select a vacancy, if you are not elected, then you cannot vote for the officers. A person selected to fill a vacancy in the office of precinct committee person may vote to fill any vacancy in a committee officer after the organizational meeting. So if you have a organizational meeting and you're appointed, you cannot vote there, but you know, say nine months into the, their term of office, the chair, uh, decides that they're retiring to Florida and they move out of state and you have to have an election. If you are appointed, then you are eligible to vote for that. So this statute only applies, uh, the limitation only applies to the reorganization meeting itself. Can, can Section 248. As a PCP. Oh, pardon, John? Yeah. Just, if you're a PCP and you're still not a point, or only an appointed PCP after nine months, there's a problem and you need to talk to your chair. Well, there's only one point where you can be elected, and that's in the primary uh, of the even-numbered years. So if you were not elected last May, then the only other way to become a PCB is to be appointed. Okay, so okay, so that's good to know, too, because I was appointed first, and I thought that all you had to do was wait for the next meeting, and then they would say, who wants to elect John? And then, and then everybody would go, yay, but that's not true. It only happened. Well, that, that's what happens, but you're still an appointed PCB, and you have all the rights of a precinct committee person except this one specific right, which is to vote in the reorganization meeting. Uh, okay, thank you for that clarification. Makes it makes it a little complicated when you have a lot of appointed people and you just have to make it clear so everyone doesn't get all bent out of shape when you when you tell them they don't get the vote. Well, yeah, exactly, like I would be, so <laughs> <laughs> thank you. The uh, next section is 248.31. The precinct committee persons of the county shall constitute the county central committee of their party. So when we talk about memberships and being a member of an assembly inside of Robert's Rules and Parliamentary Procedure, this is where it states it. Um, this goes to your question earlier, John. Um, the county central committee of each major political party is the highest party authority in county party matters and may adopt rules or resolutions for any matter of party government within the county, which is not controlled by the laws of the state. Uh, there's a lot of uh, misinformation floating about about the relationship between the counties and the state uh, as if there was some kind of top-down hierarchy, but there's not. 
the relationship between the county parties and the state is that the counties elect the delegates who are the members of the state central committee. Um, and so uh, it, uh, it's uh, the, 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 ca the state cannot tell counties what to do, um, except where it's articulated in state law. This also, and this is a little sidebar, but you know, people, I've heard people say that, that counties cannot pass resolutions uh, that uh, take different positions on ballot measures or candidates than the state does. That's not true. They, they're, they're more than, uh, uh, it's more than uh, acceptable for them to do that by state law. Uh, the next slide uh, for section 248.33. This is the one that makes the county organizations very interesting. The organizational meeting of a county central committee shall be no less than frequently than every 25 months. So every 25 months or less, a county has to have a reorganization. Notice that it does not say that it has to happen in December or November or January of the, of the uh, following the general election. It's just within 25 months. It used to be that most of the counties reorganized between say November and February, but people have started, de some of the counties have deviated, and so we find some of them being a year uh, later, um, you know, completely 180 degrees off the, the, what used to be the normal cycle. The only requirement is it has to be uh, within 25 months. Uh, then there's rules about the transition. So the retiring county central committee shall prepare a written notice designating the time, date, and place of the meeting and file a copy of that notice with the county clerk no later than the 40th day before the date of the meeting. So if you know the date of your meeting and it's sometime in um, November, uh, so 40 days before that, it is the responsibility of the uh, uh, retiring central committee to notify your county clerk of your election. Um, and it also says that you have to send a notice to the state central committee so that they know when the reorganizations are happening. Uh, the Third part of this, upon request of a county central committee, the county clerk shall provide county central committee without charge a list of the names, addresses, and other contact information, including electronic mail addresses or telephone numbers of persons holding the office of precinct committee person for that major political party on the date the clerk receives notice of an organizational meeting for. So this, this uh, even if it's way after the election of PCPs, you know, there will be hopefully PCPs uh, added through appointment and tracked through the county clerk. This says that the county clerk has to give the central, the county central committee, a list of all the eligible voters. So there's there's no ambiguity over who's eligible to vote hey, and who should be notified. A couple questions on this. A question for Barbara. So central committees only have to meet every two years. No, just the reorganization meeting has to be every two years. Okay, the reorganization meeting has to be every two years, 25 months. So aren't the nominating thing we're doing on, uh, 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 on the 11th, that's just to pick people to run, but has the, has the DPO announced a reorg? Is that, has that been scheduled? Yes, that's going to be March 16th and 17th of 2019. Oh, oh okay. <clears throat> so we could hold other nominating events after that if we don't, if we need to, right? Yes. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Um, and so that, that is an interesting question. So the state law only requires a county to meet once every 25 months. The other meetings of the county should be governed in the bylaws. And hopefully it says something like meets monthly unless the, the, the central committee decides not to. Uh, but if there's nothing about meeting, uh, then there's nothing that requires you to meet. Uh, section, next slide please, uh, section 248.33.4. The chairperson of the retiring county central committee shall mail a copy of the notice of the time, date, and place of the meeting no later than the 10th day before the meeting to each member of the county central committee if permitted by the bylaws of the county central committee. The county may notify members by means other than mail. So if you have done a, if you're a county party and you've done a, a bang up job and in, in having valid email addresses for all of your members, then you could get by with not uh, mailing them. And you know, the, if you have a lot of members, the cost could be significant. If 
you're like Multnomah County, which has now something like 950 elected precinct committee persons, you know, the, 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 the bill for just mailing notices is going to be well over uh, around $400, not counting even the appointed ones. Um, but this is a requirement that every member has to be notified 10 days before the meeting. Otherwise, uh, your election could be challenged and invalidated. On the next slide, uh, 248.35. At the organizational meeting of a county central committee, the officers of the retiring county shall make available to the committee the property, records, and funds owned or controlled by the retiring committee. The committee shall elect a chairman, vice chairman, and other officers of the committee that the committee considers necessary. The persons elected to the officers need not be members of the central committee. Uh, this is something that... Um, uh, it's probably not apparent to everyone, but you can have uh, people who are Democrats but are not PCPs, but they could be elected to officers. And even here in, in uh, Clatsop County, we have a treasurer who is not a precinct committee person, but is a great treasurer. And our chair was not a precinct committee person. He was just a registered Democrat, and he was, he was a chair. Only a newly elected precinct committee person may vote on the election of committee officers. So this is a reiteration of what was less explicitly stated earlier. Uh, the elected chairperson within 48 hours of the chairperson's election shall send a list of the officers of the committee to the county clerk and to the state central committee. So within, 20, within 48 hours, within two days, they have to notify the county and the state central committee of the officers that have been elected. And I believe this is the final one, so 248.35. Only a newly elected precinct committee person or a person appointed or selected to fill a vacancy uh, in the office of committee person may vote to fill a vacancy in the committee office. Uh, immediately before a meeting of the county central committee at which there may be an election to fill a vacancy in a committee office, the chairperson shall obtain from the county clerk a list of the committee members. The list shall determine the eligibility of the committee person to vote to fill a vacancy in the committee office. So again, the county retains the full list of elected and appointed precinct committee persons. And if there anything gets contested and drug into court, they will go to the county clerk for an official list of who is eligible to vote. Oh, there is one more. Uh, so on the next slide, it talks about proxies. So uh, sometimes we get questions about, you know, I can't make the meeting. Is there any way to proxy vote? Uh, proxy voting is one of those things that is explicitly uh, banned from parliamentary procedure. It really wants people to be engaged in a meeting and hearing the discussion and what goes on before they vote. And if you have a proxy vote, then you don't meet that criteria. So the law says, proxies in no instance shall be permitted to participate at any county central committee meeting. At any meeting of the county central committee, the committee may, number one, adopt, amend, or repeal bylaws or rules for the government of the political party in the county. By adoption of bylaws or a resolution, select an executive committee and authorize the executive committee to exercise those powers delegated to it by the central committee, including but not limited to the power to fill a vacancy in the office of committee person. In no event may the central committee delegate or the executive committee exercise the power to elect a person to or fill <coughs> a vacancy in a committee office. The person selected as the executive committee need not be members of the county central committee. So this is where the powers are delegated to the county central committee by the state to do these things. So those are the laws that I found governing uh, state parties. And the key ones in there that if they were being missed before are the ones about notification of the county clerk. 40 days in advance, and then notification 10 days in advance of all of your members of your reorganization date, time, and location. Any questions on that section, John? Nope. Nope. Everybody's <coughs> just, uh, just hanging out. Uh, the next one is on political party bylaws. Uh, so on the next slide, uh, next slide after that, um, you, you have to be clear on the distinction between officers and delegates because they tend to be elected at the same time and 
and uh, it's not uh, the distinction between them is not always clear. But officers are listed in the bylaws uh, under a section called officers, um, and it depends on how your county bylaws are written on whether or not they're considered um, uh, whether delegates are considered officers. Uh, delegates are usually not listed in the officers, and in our bylaws here in Clatsop County, uh, there's actually no reference to the delegates in the bylaws themselves. So we take all of our guidance from the Democratic Party of Oregon, for whom we elect them. Um, and th then, as we said before, delegates are different than officers in that both elected and appointed precinct committee persons can vote for them. So appointed, or ex appointed precinct committee persons cannot vote in the reorganization meeting itself. Um, but after the reorganization meeting, uh, both appointed and elected precinct committee persons can vote for everything. Uh, you need to get hold of your county bylaws so you fully understand what they say about elections. Um, so the things to look for uh, are the creation of the nominations committee. Hopefully your bylaws talk about how that is done. If it's not in the bylaws, then you default to the processes outlined in Robert's Rules of Order. Um, that should outline the method of nominating candidates and it should talk about the positions to be filled. And then there should be rules governing elections on whether or not you have to use ballots, uh, if you can vote by acclamation, if you have only one candidate for an office, um, if there's uh, what the notification requirements, if they're more stringent than what the state law says, and also the order of election. So it's not arbitrary uh, in what order the um, uh, offices are elected. Uh, if you do not have anything that states to the contrary in your bylaws, then you do it in the, uh, in the order of president, vice president, uh, secretary, treasurer. On the next two slides, I have listed the entire language that's in my county's bylaws. And this is fairly typical of what you find in county bylaws. The, the, the bylaws themselves are only six pages, unlike some of them, which are now uh, in excess of 25 pages long. Um, but it, 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 you know, it, it, it's just a framework for having the, uh, outlining the, the elections themselves. So the, in Clatsop County, it says a nominating committee of three members shall be elected at the September meeting prior to the organizational meeting. So that, that, that for us, that will be this month in September because our organizational meeting is in November. The committee shall report at the October meeting and elections will be held in the, or at, at the organizational meeting. Nominations from the floor will be accepted at the October and November meeting. Consent from any nominee must be obtained before placing his or her name in the nomination. Um, you mean you really mean you got to get their permission before you nominate somebody? Darn, yeah. <laughs> it kind of kind of reduces the thrash. <laughs> yeah, it does. Uh, other salient things on that: uh, it's best not to regard the nomination committee as who selects only one candidate and therefore making an election superfluous the nominating committee should really take the names of anyone interested in running for office. They should help the, uh, the people interested understand the commitment that they are signing up for. So they don't sign up for something for which they cannot fulfill. Um, and they shouldn't be discouraging people from running. Um, in many counties, you know, we don't have a lot of people that want to step up and do stuff. And so the challenge is really the kind of the reverse. If you could get one person for every slot, you're doing really good. But to have a healthy democracy, uh, it would be great if you actually had someone to vote for and a choice on the on the on the election. So, so what you're saying is the nominating committee facilitates all nominees or all people that want to run. They don't get to pick and choose who gets to run. Correct. Okay, that's a very clear. It should be agnostic. <laughs> all right. Should. <clears throat> And then the next slide uh, talks about nominations and elections. All officers shall be elected by ballot at the organizational meeting, except in the case of one candidate for an office when the vote may be by voice. 
uh, in, if you read Robert's rules, it says that unless this stipulation is placed in the bylaws, even though there's one candidate, you need to, uh, and, and it requires election by ballot, you need to pass out ballots and go through the exercise of, of voting. Um, because you, know, you might want that in that you'll then have evidence that this person was actually a, was elected. The officers shall be elected for two years or until their successors are elected. Any vacancies for the office of chairperson, uh, uh, and they list them, the vice chairman, secretary, treasurer shall be filled at the next meeting of the central committee, which shall be held within 30 days of the vacancy. So if our chair resigns, like the, the current one did a couple of months ago because he was running for county commissioner, the, the election to replace him had to, be ha had to happen within 30 days. And that's stated in the bylaws. Uh, it's not stated in the state law. Um, it's in bylaws. And if you don't have that within your bylaws, then it, you, you default to what Robert's Rule says, and they don't say anything about the timeliness of doing a, a re-election. Hey, Larry, question from Barb, because uh, I'm getting confused. Are these all Oregon specific? Is this Robert's Rules across the Dem Party specific? So what I, so the section from the Clatsop County is specific to the Clatsop County Central Committee. There's equivalent language in each county's bylaws which lays this out, which is why you need to track down the bylaws and uh, and see what they say. But that also should be across all 50 states. There shouldn't be there should be county bylaws um, uh, for every county in in the United States that that states this stuff. All right, and then what you're is referencing what you're referencing otherwise is the Roberts Rules quotes on it. Right. Yes. Which isn't necessarily what the county bylaws are. It's just what Robert's Rule says you need to do about it. Right. Okay. So the what Robert's Rules provides as a as a foundation and default things that that you you go to if they're not specified in your bylaws. And your bylaws cannot violate any of the fundamental rules of parliamentary procedure. But otherwise, uh, your bylaws can have a lot of flexibility in how they conduct their business uh, because your assembly has agreed to them. This is how that your your group has agreed to operate as a as a um, as an entity. All right. Thank you for that clarity. Uh, next slide. Uh, so note note that in the Classic County bylaws, no date was specified for the reorganization, which is probably not a good thing. Uh, so the only only the state law of within twenty five months applies. <clears throat> there's nothing that says that we would have this in November. It's just that that's when we've traditionally had them. And there's reasons why November is a good month to do this. Um, but the only requirement is it has to be within 25 months. So we could have a reorganization in, in 12 months if we wanted to. The organization section does not include delegates. So delegates could be elected separately on a different date. And, uh, there is a there is a section in the state Democratic Party of Oregon bylaws that talks about them being elected at the same time as officers, but the state party doesn't control the county parties. So, and, and by delegates, we're talking delegates to the state central committee from the, your county. Is that what we're talking about? It's enormously complex <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and and confusing. Um, awesome. So, yeah, there's two. There's actually two kinds of delegates that each county uh, gets to elect. There are delegates to the state central committee, which is the governing body of the Democratic Party in the, in the state. And then we also have delegates to each of the five congressional district committees, which has their own uh, set of duties uh, to fulfill, which are outlined in the Democratic Party bylaws. But like U.S. House congressional district? That or no? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah, we have five, and we have five congressional district committees. And what they do is that they elect uh, the members of the standing committees. And what that guarantees, because that covers all the geography of the of the of Oregon, it it guarantees that the membership of the standing committees has geographic uh, parity. Wow. Okay. Thank you. 
Um, the next slide then is about standing rules. Um, and if you've been following along with the other, uh, the other um, segments that we've been recording on Robert Schulz, you'll know that there's actually three components of, of your bylaws. Really, there's the bylaws, which you cannot suspend for in, in general. There are special rules, which you can suspend with a two-thirds vote that have to do with uh, people's rights. And then there are standing rules, which you can pass and suspend with a majority, a simple majority. Um, standing rules are generally used for laying out the procedure. Um, here in Clatsop County, we, we ended up passing a number of rules that governed how delegates and alternate delegates were to be elected because it felt like it was too complicated to be reinventing every time we had an election. So uh, we, we then go down to the standing rules for the elections of the delegates. Um, uh, but it uh, really uh, applies to the process of electing um, at, a, at a procedural level. And it also should specify things like, will you do one ballot where everyone who's going to be elected uh, uh, is listed, or if you're going to be electing every office separately in sequence with separate ballots for each one. So you can either do one ballot for chair, vice chair, secretary, treasurer, and delegates, or you could do the, the second one uh, where you do a one ballot for your chairs and one ballot for the vice chairs and one ballot for your secretary and one for your treasurer. And the benefit of that is, you know, if you have several people vying for the first place office, maybe you want to allow them to run for another office. And if you stagger them, then they could do that. <clears throat> um, we do separate balloting for alternates uh, because there are people who, who are willing to be an alternate, but they don't want to do a commitment to the be a delegate to the state central committee because it, it often requires travel to far corners of the state. And so they, they're, you know, they're willing to go to one or two meetings a year if, if necessary, but they don't want to make a commitment to the full one. So they, we allow people to run for alternate delegate as a specific distinctive position from delegates. So that's what you can find in the standing rules. And, you know, as I said, the great thing about standing rules is that you can always suspend them with a majority vote. So even, even some of the more elaborate procedures that we follow for like elections of um, uh, DNC delegates within the state central committee, we could actually suspend those and do something else if we wanted to. Uh, it's just that those rules have worked fairly well in the past and there's really no reason uh, to, uh, to change them. Next section then is specifically about Robert's rules and what it says that you need to do. And I realize that, that this is a lot of information, but again, the great thing about this being recorded is you can then go back and review it. And the best thing to get out of this is the concepts so that you can go and research them specifically when you encounter that circumstance. So again, the uh, next slide, please. The default for Robert, the default rules for anything not covered in the bylaws and the standing rules and the state law is Robert Schulz of Order. And what they outline things are like the nomination process and the voter requirements. Uh, next slide, please. So the Robert Schulz of Order is adamant that the chair cannot be a member of the nominating committee. Uh, the chair is, is just too influential and, it, and they really need not to be involved in that process. There's two methods that make a lot of sense for county parties of the four listed. Um, one is nominations on the floor and nominations from uh, the nominations committee. And as you saw in the Clatsop County bylaws, they allowed for both of those inside the bylaws themselves. So at this next coming meeting in September, we will form the committee. And if someone wants to run for chair or, or delegate, they can start informing the committee of their interest to do that then. Um, as usually happens, we end up at the October meeting and no one's volunteered for anything. <laughs> and then we can start asking for nominations from the floor. And, you know, usually we get a couple of them from the floor. And then the nominations committee really has to hunker down and, and start asking people specifically, will you serve to be in these offices uh, because we have to fill a slate? And the, nominated, the nominating committee should be elected from the floor rather than appointed by the chair. So I just want to point out that what you just said 
kind of explains how the nominating committee ends up picking people for roles because oftentimes you have people that don't run and then they got to fill spots and so they're just going out there hey buddy you can do this right and and so it's going to be left to the people that and sometimes i mean i could just see that ending up you know twisting the, the process and what it really tells us is we really gotta everybody's got to participate in this and run for these roles yes and it's not healthy for the same people to fill the roles time after time after time. It gets efficient because they know how to do things. But what you really want to do is uh, build up uh, a knowledge base and a, and, a, and a bench inside of the party of these people with the knowledge so you don't end up with one person knowing how to run everything, um, which is not healthy. Well, and, and that's kind of when I came into this before I started working with you and really go into meetings and understand what was going on that I was intimidated. It's like, well, I, I'm, I couldn't do that. I, I couldn't be a PCPA and it's bullshit. This, I mean, let's, it's, we can all do it. Look at some of the idiots that are in positions of power. <laughs> anyway, go on. Indeed. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is important to remember uh, when you're trying to elect members of your nominating committee. Members of the nominating committee are not barred from being nominees themselves unless the bylaws specify one candidate for each position. The committee may nominate multiple candidates for each position. So number one, just because so-and-so is on, a, on, a, on the committee, they're not being self-serving <coughs> um, by nominating themselves for a position. They're more than welcome to run for an office. Um, uh, they just agreed to take on the extra work of finding people to fill all the slots. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> and, and just as a strategic note, always good to be friends with the people on the nominating committee. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm sure everyone elects good people that, uh, that operate ethically. So, Of course, that's Never mind. So officers are elected in the order listed in the bylaws. Uh, so if, if if under officers it starts with chair and then vice chair, that is the order in which you elect the positions. Uh, and there's two approaches. Um, as I said before, either all nominations are completed prior to voting and it's all done on one ballot, or voting on each office is conducted separately on separate ballots. So there is a balloting procedure, <clears throat> um, and there's such a thing as a teller's report. And this is if you want to you know, have a, a rock-solid election that's unquestionable in its results. The chair appoints tellers to distribute, collect, and count ballots and to report the vote. For small groups, two to three tellers should be sufficient. Uh, and then tellers should be chosen for their accuracy and should have no direct personal involvement you want everything to be fully transparent. These are details that it's great to think out of in advance so you don't get to the meeting and then have nobody who's been designated to help with the distribution of ballots. Um, if you can work all these details out in advance, then you'll have a much smoother meeting. Robert's Rules talks about the balloting procedure, so each ballot should be folded in a manner announced in advance or stated on the ballot itself like fold in half. Um, it is the teller's responsibility to see that no member votes more than once. And whatever method is of collecting ballots is followed, it should be fixed by rule or custom and should not be subject to haphazard variation. So, you know, whether it's everyone go to the back of the room and drop in the box or everyone sit in their chairs and, and the tellers will circulate amongst you or whatever the process it is, it should be, it should be consistent. Next slide, this is where it gets very, very important on how it's handled and where in instructions are important to your tellers before they do the job. Tellers should ignore blank ballots and other ballots that indicate no preference, treating them as abstentions. And there's a reason why this is important. Um, all ballots that indicate a preference are taken into account in determining the number of votes cast for purposes of computing a majority. This was something that, that I wasn't clear on for a long time, but it's, 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 
it's important to know that you need a majority to elect a delegate. Uh, and it's not just the person, it's not a plurality, which could be 40% of the vote. It's got to be a majority, which is 50%, over 50%. And so you have to have a way of calculating what a majority is. And a majority is not the number of people in the room because anyone who abstains from voting then is not counted in the calculation of the majority. Hey, Larry. Got a is that clear or do I need to repeat it again? Yes, John. <laughs> uh, I, I, I think I got that. Uh, un unclear on something else, though. D uh, David McCall asks, isn't the proper practice that the chair of the nominating of or election committee appoint tellers? It might be a custom in your county, but it's not a requirement. It, the, I believe Robert Schrill says that the chair appoints the tellers. Okay. Thank you. Next slide. Um, technical errors like the misspelling of a word or a name do not make a vote illegal if the meaning of the ballot is clear. Like hanging chads. <laughs> If one or more ballots are identifiable as cast by persons not entitled to vote, those ballots are excluded. Uh, so if you, if you're most like most counties and you just filled out slips of paper, uh, you probably don't have a way of identifying um, improperly cast ballots. Next slide. Uh, if there is evidence that any unidentifiable ballots were cast by persons not entitled to vote, and if there is any possibility that such ballots might affect the result, the entire ballot vo vote is null and void and a new ballot vote must be taken. Um, the big caveat there is it's got to be a close vote. So if you have one person who who might have voted and, uh, and wasn't eligible to vote, but everyone won by a landslide, then their vote doesn't really matter. They shouldn't have voted, but it didn't matter. So the val the vote is still valid because you know that a majority had, had cast their ballots for the winning candidates. Question on that? Yeah. So with the same, so this is a different thing than what applied in like your meeting you were talking about the other day on Zoom where there was 19 votes, but there really should have only been 18. Would that same kind of, Remember that? And it was like, well, we don't know who that 19th person was and whether they could vote on it. It is the same thing. It is the same thing. Okay. Yes. Okay. But, uh, you know, one vote would not have changed the result right. of what we had voted on. So there's no grounds to contest it. Okay. If it had been, if it had lost by one vote, then yes, we would have gone back after it. Okay. All right. Um, the next slide is on ballots. So you must contain a blank for write-in candidates. Uh, so people, even though you have a nominations committee, people should be uh, able to write in names. Um, unintelligible ballots or ballots cast for an unidentifiable or eligible candidates are treat or eligible eligible candidates are treated as illegal votes. That must mean ineligible candidates. They are counted as votes cast but are not credited to any candidate. This is where it goes into um, calculating a majority. So if 10 votes were cast, uh, and if 11 votes were cast, and one of them was not intelligible as to what they wanted to do, it was still a cast ballot and goes into the calculation of what a majority is. A ballot that contains votes for too many candidates for a given office is counted as one illegal vote cast for that office. Again, this goes into the calculation of a majority. That's just weird. That's really crazy rules. It goes, it goes to that, that awkward situation, though, where you have people in the room that don't vote. So if you've got 100 people in the room and 10 of them vote, then someone could be elected by a majority of six. All right. Well, let's just, and yeah, I hope that doesn't happen. <laughs> really? Um, so the next slide is an example of what the format of a teller's report is. So you should list the number of votes cast. That's really weird. You have weird formatting. Number of votes cast, 
uh, the majority necessary for election. So if you have uh, <coughs> 10 votes cast, it would be six to be a majority. And then you would list what each of the candidates received. <coughs> Excuse me. So if uh, a candidate one received four votes and candidate two received three votes and candidate three received the rest, then no one attained a majority and you'd have to vote again. You'd also report the number of illegal votes. The teller's report should not include the number of members eligible to vote, nor the number abstaining. So again, if there's 100 people in the room and 10 of them cast ballots, the teller's report includes nothing about the 90 people who didn't vote. Uh, next slide. The results are always declared by the chair, not by the teller. The teller's report is entered in full in the minutes, becoming a part of the official records of the organization. And the tally sheets and ballots are given to the secretary who keeps them under seal uh, until it's time to get rid of them. Next slide. So this is where the election of delegates gets interesting. An election where ballot for votes are cast for multiple positions, every ballot with a vote for one or more candidates is counted as one vote cast. And a candidate must receive a majority of the total votes cast in order to be elected. Uh, if you have a county like Multnomah County, which in the last reorganization had 20 um, state central committee delegates to elect, and I don't know how many people ran, let's say 50 people ran, um, it's quite possible that a number of the slots will not be uh, filled with a majority vote. It's, you don't just take a vote and then fill them in the order of votes counted. Anyone who did not receive a majority is not elected. If more than the prescribed number receive a majority vote, the positions are filled by the proper number receiving the most votes. So if you have 10 votes to 10 slots to fill and, um, and you've got half of them receiving over the majority, then they're filled in the order that they received and the other five are not elected and you have to conduct another vote, now, which I talk about on the next slide. So if less than the proper number of receive a majority vote, those who do have a majority are elected and all others remain as candidates for the necessary repeated balloting. Dropping the candidate with the least votes is not allowed unless it's specified in the bylaws or the standing rules. Uh, so you, you, know, you can't assume that you can follow the, the Democratic Party of Oregon rules if you've not adopted them in your county. Um, for the election of DNC delegates, uh, the, after the first round of balloting, the rules say that you drop off those who receive less than a certain percentage and you drop off the lowest receiving vote. So if you have five candidates and one candidate received hardly any votes and the other one, uh, and you have someone else who was the lowest receiving votes, then you would drop off two and then you'd continue on. Regardless, um, uh, uh, of who's not received a majority. So there, the fundamental rule is that you do not drop off anyone. If you need a process for narrowing down the, the list of candidates, then you have to specify that process in either your bylaws or your standing rules and um, uh, so that everyone is clear on it. It has to be rules that are agreed upon by your assembly. It's not rules made up by the nominations committee. It's not rules made up by the chair. It's not rules made up by the executive committee. It's rules that the assembly has voted on for doing this. So as you can imagine, if you have a number of diehard uh, vote splitters and you've, you've, even though you've had 10 ballots and you still, you know, had no one has dropped off and no one has received a majority to fill all the slots, you have to continue balloting until uh, someone gets a majority. Well, that's just annoying. <laughs> it's a strong argument for having a process for dropping people off if this becomes, you know, a, a recurring uh, pain. Uh, but again, and, and you're welcome to do that. It's just that everyone has to agree on the procedure for doing that. Sure, sure. Uh, question, a total a interesting question, just backing up a bit here. Uh, Marjorie says, 
write-in candidates could be a problem, they'd have to consent to be written in, wouldn't they? How does that work? Um, hopefully, your bylaws will will cover that. <laughs> if you have a if you have a ballot and you you know and someone has has consented, well, if someone has been written in and they only receive one vote, it's kind of a non-issue. If if you have someone who receives uh, a majority of the votes, then they've probably done something to trigger a write-in campaign, uh-huh. and and so it's it's going to be okay. Um, it's usually not an issue uh, because you can't win with one vote. You have to win with a majority. Well, and that, I mean that makes I mean that that's like like a silent coup, right? It's like everybody vote for Bill. <laughs> Bill's going to do yeah. it, right? Bill, Bill knows what you can do. So, somebody's going to get the word around to Bill. Yeah, it, it would be a bigger issue if your bylaws allowed you to vote to elect people by a plurality where they actually do get, you know, one vote could fill a slot and that person didn't agree to it. Then then that 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 uh, that that uh, circumstance could arise. All righty, then. Well, another one of those. We'll just hope it doesn't happen. Uh, the next section is th- about the recent changes to the bylaws in the Democratic Party of Oregon. And the reason why other states would be interested in this is that you're probably going to face these issues soon if you've not felt with them already. Uh, so what I've listed here on the next two slides is the language that was passed at the last meeting and is now included on the state Democratic Party of Oregon bylaws that you can go out to the website and download. Um, the first section is about did, did not change. And this is really about how your number of SCC delegates that each county is eligible for is calculated. This is not always clear. So members of the state central committee include at least two delegates elected from each county, no matter how small your county is. So Gillum County, which apparently has uh, one person in the party, they still get two eligible slots. So if they could get two members of the, the Gillum County, not Gillum County, um, there's another one over there. Yeah, there's if, if they can get two members, then they can both be delegates to the state central committee. There's another county, which I think they only have two members, and the two of them have been delegates to the state central committee for years. Um, and you get one additional delegate for each 15,000 registered Democrats. Uh, 15,000 sounds like a lot, but it turns out that Multnomah County, their population has been growing so quickly that they will probably get two additional state central committee delegates to the next reorganization, going from 20 delegates to 22. Um, here in Clatsop County, where we have a total of 26,000 registered voters in total, we would have to get 13,000 additional Democrats in order to get one more delegates to the state central committee. So it's not happening from Clatsop County anytime soon. So that's how the number of delegates are calculated. The next section is the actual language that we changed. Um, So county central committees will elect delegates and alternate delegates to the state central committee at their organizational meetings. This is where the the state is telling you to do that at your your work meeting. Vacancies may be filled by county central committee elections at subsequent meetings. County state central committee delegate and alternate delegate positions shall be elected by a process that recognizes three gender categories, female, male, and non-binary, that assures that no gender category shall have greater representation than 50% or, in the case of an odd number, 50% plus one. So this is where the big change came in. It used to be male and female, and it is now male, female, and non-binary. And... uh, and none of those categories can be greater than 50%. So if you're a county like uh, Clatsop County that gets three state central committee delegates, we can have no more than one male and one female, or we can have no more than two of one gender and one of another gender, including the non-binary. So it's possible we could have one male, one female, and one non-binary. We could have two males, one female. We could have two females, one male. Uh, or we could have two non-binary and one of the other gender, but we can't have three of any one gender. Isn't that just a better, you can't have three of any one gender. Why didn't you guys just write it like that? 
because you could be Multnomah County with 22 delegates and suddenly it's, it's a bigger deal. So if you've got 22 delegates, you shouldn't have more than 11 of anything. All right. The last one is just the last paragraph is just to make it absolutely clear. Non-binary delegate positions shall reduce the male and female delegate positions as evenly as possible. Replacement preference for alternate delegates will utilize gender category first. So the vision was that we would be able to roll these changes out to all the county parties in time for them to make any kind of adjustments that they need to to their processes in time for their reorganizations if they start this coming November. Okay. Do you think anybody is? Uh, getting ready? To start like in November. Oh, yeah. Oh, really? Um, yeah. Uh, our county is. Uh, Usually the counties that that, that um, organize before the end of the year uh, have been doing this and and are and you know have followed the process. There's counties where their organization has has really been uh, decimated, and there's just a few people struggling on. And so the customs and processes that they followed uh, have you know have not been uh, adhered to as rigorously as you know they need to. Um, so it, it's possible that they're, they've not been thinking about it. A lot of people think, oh, no, we're not going to get to this until the November election is over because we're so busy supporting candidates. You know, you don't spend 24 hours a day working on the stuff for candidates. And so the leadership of every county needs to be paying attention to this stuff, like the notifications to the county clerk and what processes you're going to follow when you actually have the uh, the the meeting. Because you, you might have candidates. Uh, uh, people, multiple people running for these positions. And unless you have a well thought out, consistent process uh, that's transparent, then people start getting antsy and, and you end up with a train wreck of a meeting. Is it important for the counties to get their reorg done before the big, the, the state reorg? It's always nice because then you have the, the forward looking delegates making decisions on on the incoming delegates. Uh, it's um, what you don't want to have is people who are leaving office, selecting people that are, that are moving forward because as we've seen in the past, you know, you get uh, a progressive wave moving in uh, that wants to change things. And then you have contention if you're left with uh, officers that reflect the prior uh, the prior delegations uh, preferences. All right. And the reason I bring this up is because somebody else brought it up and I'll tell you about that later, but it sounds like this is another reason for us to do multiple nominating events so that we give these counties time to make some choices and know who's available to, to do the big gig. Yeah, the, what we really would like to avoid is what happened this last time where we had a bylaws change and we had legacy delegates voting for the delegates to the Democratic National Committee who were going to be out of office within uh, a month or two. <coughs> Excuse me. So what happens now is, um, unless something gets changed again, when we go to elect our Democratic National Committee members in two years, in, in uh, December of 2020, uh, all the people voting for those officers will be the current member, the current voting delegates of the state central committee. Uh, and so everyone should be happy. Um, and, uh, you know, I would encourage all the counties to do their reorganizations prior to that December meeting so that you do have current delegates voting for these people. Um, uh, it just, if you get, if you start getting a division between people who are in the 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 assembly and the people who are your leadership, then you know you start having problems in the organization, and ultimately you could end up with a recall of the officers, which would be uh, uh, you know just an incredible waste of time. You but you really want leadership that reflects the values of the membership. That's how democracies work. <laughs> Right, so we've got to get on this stuff at the county level, folks, if we want to ha make the decisions at the state level. So slide 38, 
um, uh, this is where the chairs really have to be on the ball. And I hear, hear stories all the time about the, the state of not being reported up, and it just makes it a nightmare for the credentials committee when we go to have a, a meeting of the state central committee. Um, the chair of every county central committee certifies the names and addresses of its delegates and alternates to the state central committee. Delegates are seated by the state central committee if the electing county central committee has been established according to the law and these bylaws. And the terms, the state central committee delegate and alternate terms begin on the day they are elected by their county central committees. So now there's no more ambiguity about when your term of office begins. Um, it, it starts on the day that you're elected. Um, and this slide really refer, refers back to the, the, the non-binary male-female stuff. The, the, um, uh, what that really means is that your delegation must be gender balanced. So whatever process you use to arrive at that, that's what you need to end up with. Um, and just so everyone knows, when you replace delegates with alternate delegates, that should also strive to maintain a gender balanced delegation. So if a a female is unable to attend as a delegate, you should look for the next, uh, the highest ranking female alternate delegate to replace that person, not the highest ranking delegate, which could be a non-binary or, or a male. That's, that's interesting that this is a, is this, this is a Rob, I'm sorry, is this a DPO rule? Yes. Okay. So the DPO set this rule for the party at the state level. We need this rule at the national level, and we need it for Congress, don't you think? That wow, that'd be cool. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yes. This uh, so the Roberts Rules doesn't recognize gender, um, except when they start using pronouns, and often they trip over themselves trying to do that. But the, there is no no requirement for gender balance inside of Roberts Rules. It just talks about people being uh, certified and being official members uh, in order to participate in meetings. And finally, on the next slide, there's just one uh, uh, best known method that, that, that I use for counting ballots that helps uh, with the accuracy. I've seen people, you know, have a spreadsheet and they go through it one ballot at a time and each ballot's got, you know, 15 people listed on it. And so they're trying to mark the, each person into a spreadsheet or, or do hash marks or whatever the process is for tallying votes. Um, what I like to do is make it very, very clear. And you know, this is also something that should be watched over by several people just to make sure that there's no mistakes made. But if you're counting delegates for chair and you have two candidates, um, you would separate those into two piles and then you would count the ballots for candidate number one and you would count the ballots for candidate number two, as opposed to going through ballot one saying, Oh, candidate A got this one, looking at the next ballot and then, running the risk of accidentally marking the wrong one. If you separate them into physical separate piles, it's uh, more clear when you count and you have a higher chance of accuracy. And if you happen to be doing them all on all of your elections on one ballot, uh, you just count stuff multiple times. So you do the two piles or, you know, if you have two candidates for chair, you do it in two piles. If you have three candidates and a write-in for vice chair, then you would do four piles. Um, and then you can validate also that you, you've not made any mistake in your sorting, and then your counting is absolutely accurate. So if you use the, the, the multiple pile method for sorting ballots and counting them, then you're going to arrive at a uh, inarguable accurate count at the end of the process. <laughs> you're making me laugh because it, it sounds like, uh, you know, it's not a raffle. Don't do it like a raffle. <laughs> okay. It's not a raffle. You know, yeah. It's a little more important. <laughs> A, a question here, an interesting question, although I think this may have been addressed earlier. Um, Dave, David McCall asks, because the DPO sends SCC notices out to the SEC delegates on record, what happens if the SEC delegation changes after the notices have been sent out to the old delegates? <coughs> um, that's why the, the Democratic Party of Oregon urges can't, uh, uh, county committees to notify them of any changes that happen. You know, if you've got a small delegation of two people, uh, the changes are fairly infrequent. 
Uh, in a larger county like Multnomah County, where you've got 20 delegates and 20 alternate delegates, uh, it it ends up that not only do you have to replace delegates with alternate delegates frequently, you end up uh, having elections because people uh, drop out. Uh, so really the only requirement that has to be met is that the state has to notify delegates that they have on record as of the day the notice goes out. And if the delegation changes, then, you know, they, there should, there should be a best effort to notify them, but you can't notify 10 days in advance someone who doesn't exist. Um, so hopefully the chair has stepped in and is helping negotiate the information and making sure that the right delegates are signed up and ready to go to the meeting. Any other questions? There, it was really informative. Uh, thank you. We got through a lot of slides. That was 46, 44 slides, everybody. I always forget about how complicated elections are until I get into one. And um, this just reinforces how how much work we need to do between now and our reorganization here in our little county. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah. And, you know, here's me, a noob, coming in going, I didn't even know we had all these elections. What's all this crap going on? And so there's a whole bunch of stuff that we really need to get involved with at the at the bottom level that seems remarkably boring, but it's where all the power starts. Yes. Uh, and if you, you know, if you happen to be in a county that is not adhering to proper procedures and you're a member of the county committee, then you are more than welcome to raise a point of order and ensure that the, uh, the proper procedures are being followed. Uh, you know, even if you end up with only one candidate for each office, you at least want to make everyone feel like it's an opportunity for them to run and, and that they can run and that the, the officers are not pre-selected and you have to go with incumbents. That's just a cultural thing that uh, we have to get over. Here, here. All right. Take us, take us through the end slides, Larry. Let's get out of here. Um, so if you would like to study Robert's Rules of Order, um, th these are all being prepared through the Cascadia E unit, which is going through the process of being recognized by the National Association of Parliamentarians. Um, and the intent of the Cascadia E unit is to provide a way to study parliamentary procedure in Oregon outside of the Portland metro area. So if you're in Multnomah County or Clackamas County or Washington County, it's pretty easy to go to one of the three units that meet physically together once a month. Uh, it is more difficult for people who live outside of that area. And so what the Cascadia E unit is providing you is a virtual way in which to participate and talk with other people uh, who are not necessarily Democrats or part of the Democratic Party, but have a more agnostic view of Robert's Rules of Order. And, and so what you end up getting is a, a very clear view of how democracy should be run, unbiased by uh, cultural biases that might have crept in from one of the parties. Uh, just so you know, you can be a, um, a provisional member uh, or you can be an official member. To be a member, you need to, all, all you need to do is pass a registration quiz uh, and you can become a, a member of the National Association of Parliamentarians uh, and of our, our e-group. Um, or if you don't want to take the test yet and you want to learn and make sure this is a good way for you to spend your time, you're more than welcome to be a provisional member and participate in the meetings. And this was a little subtle for me, but, you know, one of the benefits of attending these meetings is you get to participate in a meeting that is completely run according to the book. So you, if you don't have these kinds, of, these kinds of procedures going on in your county, you can see how, how it's supposed to be run. Uh, on the scholarships page, uh, so there is a nominal fee to join the e-group uh, The if you want to become a member of the National Association of Parliamentarians, uh, it is a, a larger fee, but the president of the Oregon Association of Parliamentarians has promised scholarships uh, to help anyone who needs financial assistance. Um, so there's a number of exams that you can take uh, to, if you want to become a, 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 uh, a registered parliamentarian, um, uh, you just need to contact us and we will get you in touch with someone who can administer the exams. Anyone who's a current member of the National Association of Parliamentarians can administer them. And if you go to the last slide on reference materials, these are the three books that are, um, that are key to your success. 
The one on the left is Robert Rules of Order, which will be replaced in a mere six days with the 12th edition. So uh, you might want to wait and hold off and get the 12th edition uh, instead of buying the, the 11th edition. There's probably going to be a transition period that, that uh, uh, organizations will say, you know, that we will stick with the 11th edition for a period of time. Um, but really, the only thing that should change is where the, the rules have evolved and the area where they're probably most evolving is probably in the area of, of electronic meetings because uh, it's very important for people's rights to be protected there in, in a room where you can't see everything that's going on. The middle book is Robert's Rules of Order Newly Revised. In brief, this covers 80% of the information you will ever need uh, in most meetings and allegedly contains all the, me all the information you need to, to uh, uh, pass the qualifying exam to become a member. And then the uh, book on the right um, is only available through the National Association of Parliamentarians website, but it's a study guide to uh, the registration exams, of which there are five, and, uh, and really is uh, important if you intend to move, go on and become an actual registered parliamentarian or ultimately a professional parliamentarian. Any final questions from the line, John? Uh, Schultz, he wanted to know if there was an e-version, uh, you know, if you could buy this, you know, Amazon Kindle or something like that. Amazingly enough, well, there's, there's two solutions. Uh, there's, uh, for the 11th edition, there was a CD version you could buy, uh, and it was kind of expensive, but it was on uh, a CD and you could use it if your, if your computer had a CD player. The great news about the 12th edition is that I believe it's on Kindle that it's available. So, uh, yeah, and, uh, and I believe you can pre-order it. So just go out to Amazon and see what they say. And I believe the 12th edition will come out um, for your Kindle or your Kindle app on your iPad. Awesome. awesome. And, and if you guys are broke, just go look for a torrent. I bet you there's a PDF or a torrent out there, at least of one of the more recent ones, you know, and you could at least start with that. You know, it, it, the, what was the, uh, the other thing? There's one other thing. Shoot. Ah, I can't. It was important too. Damn, I can't remember. Anyway, you know where to find us or join the group. <laughs> I was looking at the great conversation in here. There's uh, uh, you guys are. They're all over it. They're talking about it. It's like, oh, I know. I was just going to tell everybody that are, is interested in this. Okay, go watch the 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 last one we had where we we're talking about the scenarios. All right, reclaiming your rights. The, the parliamentarians are the Jedi of politics. I'm just telling you. They're absolutely the, the – they, <laughs> they do the secret stuff. All right. Uh, anything else we need to tell them, Larry? Nope. Everyone's empowered. Everybody's empowered. Yay. All right. Well, I'm going to take us out of here with a, ta a song. I always do. Hi, everybody. I've been sitting in the background. Good to, good to see you all. Um, I want to bring it back to why we're doing this. We don't – we're not doing this civic stuff and these this I know it's not the most gripping of entertainment television here and we're not even that but uh, to, to talk about Robert's rules to talk about parliamentary procedure why uh, roles in government and all that I want to remind everybody where we're at we, we don't have a, a good government at the top level right now we've lost control um, we got big problems I don't, I don't know if you guys saw um, Th this this has been really really bothering me, but I just want to bring everybody back to a little reality check. This morning, um, th th there's there's just overtly racist stuff going on from the Republican Party, and and I will draw a, dis a distinction, a separation between the Republican Party and the Democratic Party, no matter what their corporate alignment is, because I, I have not seen any Democrats be overtly racist like this, but the guy in Florida is now running robocalls against Andrew Gilliam, it, it, and it's just horrific what they're doing and what they're saying in there, and I just want to bring it back to, um, we, we have a species... And, and we have destroyed this environment that we live in. And unless we remember that we're all one species and we get our act together really quick, and I mean really quick, all this other stuff that we're talking about, Robert's Rules, all this, it's not going to matter. And we have to get back to, to that. 
And so we're slogging through all this BS, this corruption, this boring government stuff so we can take control of the wheel and save our species. That's that's really what this comes down to. So I, I hope everybody remembers that. It's we, we, we got a lot of work to do. And I just have three words for anyone who thinks this does not exist in the Democratic Party. And those three words are Debbie Wasserman Schultz. Uh, okay. Well, fine. Good point. <laughs> All right. Getting out of here. We're getting out of here with Bernie's words because as angry as the stuff going on in Florida makes me... I, I have to come back to Bernie's words because it helps me take all that anger and rage and refocus it towards useful things, right? Um, this is the opposite end of me from if I had a rocket launcher. So this is Bernie's words um, put together by a volunteer, Freeman M., uh, from Bernie 2016 TV. It's one of the most beautiful things we've ever had on the program. Thank you all for being here. This is what I believe. Every great religion in the world, Christianity, Judaism, Islam, Buddhism, essentially comes down to do unto others as you would like them to do unto you. As a 22 year old kid getting arrested in Chicago fighting segregation, I believe it in my whole life. That we are in this together, not just not words, the truth is, at some level, when you hurt, when your children hurt, I hurt. I hurt. And it's very easy to turn our backs on kids who are hungry or veterans who are sleeping out on the street. And we can develop a psyche, a psychology, which is, I don't have to worry about them. All I'm going to worry about myself, I need to make another $5 billion. Hey, this whole world is me. I need more and more. I don't care about anybody else. I believe that what human nature is about is that everybody in this room impacts everybody else in all kinds of ways that we can't even understand. It's beyond intellect. It's a spiritual, emotional thing. When we say that that child who is hungry is my child, when we do the right thing, when we try to treat people with respect and dignity, I think we are more human. That's my religion. That's what I believe in. And I think, you know, most people around the world, whatever their, their, their religion, their color, share that belief that we are in it together as human beings. If we destroy the planet because we don't deal with climate change, trust me, we are all in it together. That is what my spirituality is about. <laughs>